Jesus, we call upon you to fill our hearts with a vision of who you are, how good you are, and how you are trustworthy, and that we can completely lean on you. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would fill us with faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today uh, is the 77th anniversary of D-Day, where the Allies were attacked the, uh, the, the beaches of Normandy and France and begun the, the beginning of the end of World War II. It would be some six months later, December 16th, 1944, in which Hitler ordered his last-ditch effort of a counteroffensive against the Western Allies. And his attack would come in Belgium in the Ardennes Forest, which was a mountainous region, in which he brought together secretly 200,000 troops and all, or most of his remaining tank divisions to go against this lightly guarded area of this forest. It's known as the Battle of the Bulge. Hitler's strategy was a surprise attack, speed, overwhelming force, and it relied on the ongoing weather forecast of bad weather. You see, in 1944, the winter of 44 had been a pretty terrible winter. Uh, it was unseasonably cold, foggy, wet, and this was a critical part of the Axis strategy because the Allies had control of the air through a superior air force. Key military objective in the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge was the small town of Bastogne, where a lot of roads interse uh, were intersected, and the 104th Airborne Division uh, was defending that town and that strategic uh, place. And the German advance in the first three days was like a bulge. It, it went forward. Uh, against through uh, the ally uh, defense defenses, and it completely surrounded the uh, town of Bastogne. It was a, a siege. And on day three of the battle, General George Patton, who led the United States Third Army, brought his 220,000 troops and armored divisions, and with little sleep over the next two to three days, his army pivoted north to go against the southern German flank in order to break the siege against the town, uh, in order to liberate the 101st and apply the pressures needed against the Germans. That army had to march uh, through rough terrain, a mountainous terrain, through the forest, through bitter cold and what was blizzard conditions. And I try to imagine what it must have been like to go on that march. Your mind must have played tricks on the men. Your heart grows weary as your body grows tired. And it's even so similar in the spiritual realm, isn't it? Which our souls, as we march forward and struggle, perhaps you are in a blizzard today, or you see a blizzard coming. And our souls, our hearts can grow weary. We begin to wonder, is God there? Will he come and help me? Am I going in the right direction? Will victory be achieved? It seems to me that these are the sorts of questions that actually underlie Psalm 121. The meaning of the psalm, to, to use perhaps different language than the poetry, is that we should have what we might call a God-centered optimism. We don't know how and we don't know when, but we can keep on, the psalm is arguing, because God keeps watch. As you look at the psalm, it's clearly about journey, a pilgrimage, in which they've left the destination, but they're in between, and they haven't arrived to where, uh, where they're going. It's part of this Psalms of Ascent, beginning in chapter 120 through 135, which were often used as a, a way for pilgrimage, as the people would be traveling to Jerusalem for one of the festivals in order to make sacrifice at the temple before the Lord. And the concept of travel marks 
this entire psalm. You can look at it in verse 1. It says, I lift my eyes to the hills. And it would appear that the, the pilgrim is in a valley, kind of looking forward and seeing the hills, or it's actually, it could also be translated mountains. Seeing that mountainous terrain and the difficult challenge that lies before the path that the person is on, uh, on their way. And then verse 3, it says, he will not let your foot be moved. Uh, perhaps the better translation is give way or slip. Uh, the idea of not moved is your foot is stationary, but that's not what's going on in the psalm. It, there's tremendous movement going on within the psalm as one goes forward, and the point is, is that the foot will not slip in the rugged terrain. And then in, in verse 5, you, are, you end up being exposed to the sun during your travel. You have to sleep on the side of the road if it's a long journey, and the moon potentially will expose you to the dangers of the enemy. And in verse 8, there's that movement of going out and coming in. And the promise of Psalm 121 is that God is going to travel with you. You can keep on because God keeps watch. And I think we're invited to go on this journey with a God-centered optimism. Well, one question I'd like to ask is, what is a God-centered optimism? What does that look like? Is it the power of positive thinking? Or No, I don't think so. Biblical optimism, it's not based on your faith or your strength or your will. Biblical optimism flows out of the character, the attributes of God. And the key, the key word in the, in the psalm is the word keep. It's the word, Hebrew word shamar. And it actually occurs six times in the psalm. Verse 3, he who keeps you. Verse 4, he who keeps you. Verse 5, the Lord is your keeper. Verse 7, the Lord will keep you from all evil. Verse 7 again, the, he will keep your life. In verse 8, the Lord will keep your going out and your coming in. The Hebrew root word of shamar is usually associated with the eyes, with the eyelids. It can be uh, used in reference to being a guardian or a watchman. It's the idea of keeping or the idea of security or guarding. In Calvin's psalm commentary, he uses the phrase keep watch, which is, a, I think, a clever and right way to capture the essence of the meaning of this word. And as you look at it, the first three occurrences of keep in three, verses 3, 4, and 5, there are references, it's used as a noun in reference to God, to who he is in his character. It's part of his divine nature. He is keeper. He is the one who keeps. And then in the, the, the latter three uses in verses 7 and 8, it goes from a noun to a verb. It's the one who keeps will keep you. It's his actions. Out of his own nature, he will and promises to keep watch over you. This keeping watch is not some distant deism in which God is just observing what's going on. It's a, it's a close watching. It's like a, a mother who is watching their new toddler taking the first steps. You're right there. You're ready to catch in case he or she is about to fall. That's the idea of keeping watch in this psalm. And in terms of Christian theology, the idea of God's keeping usually comes under the, the, the doctrine of providence. The doctrine of providence. And there within the word providence, you can hear the word provide. The, the, the idea is that God, in his providing, he foresees and foreknows, he anticipates what our needs will be, and he provides, out of his benevolent goodness, out of his kindness, help. Exactly what we're going to need. Providence refers to God's will and power constantly upholding and preserving, in fact, the entire universe. Guiding and governing all human events and circumstances. Directing everything towards its intended end. To the glory of God and to our good. And there's usually a couple of aspects of when we consider the idea of providence. One is providence refers to God's his preservation of all of the cosmos. 
down to every quirk. Acts 17, 28 says, in him we live and move and have our being. The idea, our, our very essence, our very ontology is, is grounded in his will and his keeping us. Or Hebrews 1, 3 says that Christ upholds the cosmos by the very word of his power. In other words, the entire universe is held together because he is constantly, through his word, holding it together as he speaks and as he keeps. So it's an idea of this preservation, this constant preservation. But also, providence refers to God's keeping in the sense of guiding human history. Uh, The Westminster Confession says that God directs, disposes, and governs all creatures actions and things from the greatest even to the least. In other words, all of human history is moving in an intended direction by our Lord God, directing it towards, in his mystery and in his power and mystery, directing all of history towards his chosen ends. Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 1, verse 11, he works all things according to the counsel of of his will. And the Bible goes on to describe many facets of how this works out. It applies to the weather. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain, who brings forth the wind from his storehouses. That's Psalm 135, 7. It applies to the nations. He makes nations great and he destroys them. He enlarges nations and he leads them away. That's Job 12, verse 23. It applies to leaders' decisions. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever, the Lord turns it wherever he wills. That's Proverbs 21, verse 1. It even applies to seemingly arbitrary events. The lot is cast into the lap. It says in Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. If you pray, even a little, you intuitively acknowledge and are acting upon the doctrine of providence. When you pray intercessions for someone else that God would come and help, you're acknowledging that somehow, maybe you don't know how, but somehow God can act and move to help the person that you're praying for. Or when you're sitting down for dinner and you're thanking the Lord for the food, Why should you thank the Lord for the food? After all, it's we who work the land. It's we who have developed the the agriculture. And it's you who have the the ability to put food together and make it taste good. And it's you who have the job uh, to pay for all the food that's necessary. Why give God thanks? Well, because God underlies every aspect of that. And without him, the the food wouldn't be on the table because he intervenes at every place. Or uh, move from prayer to the idea of healing. Healing through medicine, whether preventative medicine or through healing therapies. Who gets the credit when the healing takes place? Well, that might help us to consider another idea that usually goes with the doctrine of providence and it's It's called concurrency. It's concurrence. Uh, And this refers to that it's not God who merely, in a unilateral decree, makes everything happen. No, it doesn't quite work that way. There is concurrence, or a simultaneous operation of both divine and human agency working and operating together at the same time. The classical formulation goes back to Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologica, where he talks about and writes about God as the primary cause, but that God normally works through secondary or mediated causes, which incorporate human agency, but in his mystery ultimately directs human freedom directly in the direction that God has decreed for his purposes of his glory and our good. Perhaps an example uh, from, from history might help. Did you know that in 1721, 
there was a major smallpox outbreak here in the city of Austin. It threatened the entire city. In fact, uh, during 1721 and 22, 50% of Bostonians contracted smallpox, and ultimately 8% of the entire population died during that outbreak. And there was significant disagreement among Christians over receiving what was a, a fairly new technology discovered of the smallpox ino inoculation in which they would take a little bit of the smallpox pus from someone infected and give it to someone who was healthy. Reverend John Williams, he railed against this new procedure, calling it unsafe, and that it, we were one who used it was lacking faith. He said to put, quote, your faith in the all-wise providence of God Almighty, unquote. By contrast, uh, Cotton Mather, his father, Increase Mather, defended the procedure, and they too, they said, this is the wonderful providence of God. Uh, uh, Increase Mather went on to argue that opposing the practice of inoculation was actually to violate the sixth command of thou shalt not kill, because it was it was needlessly leading to many more dying than was necessary. And in this debate and argument at that time, eventually most, most Boston ministers joined their voices with, with Mather, re recognizing and believing that inoculation was indeed God's divine help. And they continued to perform experiments. In fact, uh, if you did not receive, if you just got the smallpox uh, through Contracting it, you had a 15% chance at that time to die. Whereas if you received the inoculation, you had a 1% chance from dying from the inoculation. And this eventually, this, this concept eventually led to uh, the, the country doctor, Edward Jenner, recognizing that how cow, cow, the use of cowpox would, was a protective measure and then using cowpox as a way to uh, protect uh, people from uh, the, the much more deadly smallpox uh, virus. And then, of course, this eventually led to uh, mass use of the vaccines around uh, against smallpox so that uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization of the 20th, it, within the, our last century, uh, declared that smallpox had been completely eradicated. Was the use of the, the inoculation and then eventually the vaccine, man's genius and man gets the credit? No, by no means. God works through secondary human agency in order to provide his help. God's care, his help, came through the, the, the technology and the procedure. It's God, after all, who even made our bodies and gave us immune systems and gave us the wisdom to recognize how our body's and immune system works and how we can, we can manipulate our body in a positive way in order to defend ourselves from these terrible invisible viruses. It's the wonderful providence of God. Now the larger point is that God is constantly upholding and helping us. He oftentimes uses these secondary mediated means, but it's still his help. Make no mistake about that. It's his hand. It's his support. He doesn't mean sometimes he just directly intervenes without means. And this too, of course, is his goodness. And all of this lines up with the psalm in which we can recognize that we can have a true optimism, a true optimism about your life and about life in general because God has promised to keep us in his providence with many supports. Perhaps you have parents. Your parents are a secondary means of his support and help. He's given you those parents as his way of helping. Maybe you don't have parents, but he's given other means to give you friendship and love. And so we can have and should cult cultivate within our own self this God-centered optimism. Now, if it relies just on you and me, then we should be pessimistic because of our sin nature and our tendency to distort and destroy. But when we turn our eyes and fix them on God and we recognize how good 
constantly good he is to you and to me. It fills, it should fill our hearts with gratitude that this is what life is as he helps us. And it means that we can go on. Whatever the challenge, whatever the, the difficulty, we can hope in him. The Apostle Paul says hope will not put you to shame because God's love has been poured out into your hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to you. So this is the sense of what it means to cultivate a God-centered optimism. Let's ask a sec second question. How does Psalm 121 apply this God-centered optimism to life and to the journey? Well, there, there are multiple ways, and I'll just for brevity's sake focus on two. First, it applies it to our sleep. Look at verse 3 and 4. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. You see, a God-centered optimism empowers us to have strength, to keep on going, not to give up. But we get tired, don't we? We need rest, friends, and we need sleep. The journey wears us out. And, of course, therefore, we need healthy patterns of regular weekly rest and sufficient sleep every night. Are you getting that? Are you practicing that? Well, most of us at least occasionally struggle with sleep. It can be caused for different reasons, but sometimes it's caused by anxiety and a challenge around our circumstances in which we're worried. And so I wonder, are you even today struggling with worry and concern, and is it keeping you up as you put your head on your pillow? The teaching of, of Psalm 121 in verse 3 and 4 is that, listen, you can go to sleep. The journey's long, but you can rest. And you can rest assured because there's someone watching over you who will not sleep, who will not slumber. Paul Rees tells a story of a naval sailor. Their ship was sunk by a U-boat, and they clung to a small raft, some of the sailors who survived only to be picked up by a German freight ship. They were taken on board and thrown into a, a dark uh, containing cell. And the man who tells the story, the sailor who tells the story, says he had terrible nerves from all that had happened. The, the sinking ship, shipwrecked, being taken by the enemy. And he could not fall asleep. And then he remembered the childhood memorization of some 121, that God promises not to slumber or sleep. And, and as he remembered it, as it came to him, he said, Lord, there's no use both of us staying awake. If you're going to keep watch, I'll thank you for some sleep. And after realizing this, he was able to sleep soundly from then on. Of course, there are other reasons for sleep disorders. It can be ulcers or depression or alcohol use or genetics or other reasons. And that's why we need medical doctors and those who are experienced in this to help us with our sleep. But sometimes it's being caused by our emotions, by our anxiety and in response to the circumstances around us. And this is when we need to say, Lord, as you put your head on the pillow, I'm going to give you all of this. I'm going to let it go and I'm going to rest in you because I know you won't let it go. May that sleep come. But the benevolent God not only promises to watch over our sleep, but let's focus on a second from the psalm. It's concerning our steps. In verse 5, it says, He will not let your foot slip. The Lord, verse, verse 3, then verse 5, The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in. At first glance, when you read Psalm 121, it seems like a sheer prosperity, unmitigated health and, and wealth and, and good fortune, doesn't it? Oh, I'm never going to fall or slip. I'm never going to get sunburned. I, I have a, a superhero force field around me, and evil can never touch me. But biblical optimism, if wrongly understood, 
can lead to spiritual, spiritually damaging beliefs and actions. It can lead to those who get sick and who don't get well to then blame themselves or be blamed for having lack of faith. Or you can be putting money with motivated, putting money in the plate with the motivation of this, this teaching that you're going to get more back. But that prosperity teaching is just off base. It's not biblical. It's not based in scripture. It's right to have optimism in God, that he is good. But there's also this underlying presumption in which one presumes how God will bring his blessing. We think it's got to be this particular way. That's what I'm waiting for. And we lack imagination that God is actually intending good, but it's going to come in a different way. You need to open up your minds to what God intends. Or we presume when the blessing will come. We want, we're impatient. We want it now. And this is just simply too short-sighted. That's not how God works. There is blessing coming, and you've got to be patient in it as you wait. But we can also presume what the blessing will be. And this is, the, I think, the most dangerous part of this prosperity sort of teaching is, is that it's a focus on material blessing. But that's not the promise governing Psalm 121. The real promise is the presence of God, that he will go with you, that he will be with you, and that the journey that you're on is not to have a bigger house or a better job. The journey that you're on is to him in relationship. And this is something available to you, not just in the future, but right now through Jesus Christ, if your faith is being put in him. Now, this truth is really revealed right in verse 1, where the psalmist says, I lift up my eyes to the hills or to the mountains. From where does my help come? And in scripture, the mountains are always a mixed metaphor, including both difficulty and deliverance. In the giving of the law in Deuteronomy, there was cursing on Mount Gerizim and there was blessing, or there's cursing on Mount Ebal and blessing on Mount Gerizim. Mountains are a place of difficulty, you see. Abraham was tested on Mount Moriah. The high places were places of idolatry and false worship. Jesus was tempted by the devil on a very high mountain, it says in the Gospels. Mountains are a place of challenge and of temptation, but they're also a place of deliverance where, for example, Moses received the law on Mount Sinai. Elijah defended God's honor against the prophets of Baal on, on Mount Car Carmel. And, and in Psalm 121, the focus here is they're on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, specifically to Mount Zion, which would be the very presence of God in his holy temple. Ironically, Mount Zion from the plain can't even be seen. All you see is all those other difficult places. But you see, embedded within the challenge of the mountain range that you're going in is also deliverance. Perhaps today you're feeling that your metaphorical journey that you're on is bringing about fear, or you sense danger around you, or you're you're just not sure about the next step that you're supposed to take. Perhaps it is around a job or a souring romance or there's a thorn in the flesh of your affliction that's afflicting you and you can't seem to get rid of it. Or there's a, an overwhelming concern for a child. Perhaps you're venturing off to university or perhaps you're just arriving for univers university. God's promise, his promise of caring for you, helping you, is not keeping you from the challenge and difficulty. The promise is that he will go with you, carrying you through the difficulty. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. It's not a guarantee of material success, but it's a guarantee that you will get the victory. And the victory is relationship with the living God who loves you and has given you so much. So the, the lesson of Psalm 121, the take-home message, is to keep on because God keeps watch. You don't know how and you don't know when, 
But friends, you stay in the game. You don't give up. You don't throw in the towel. You keep on swinging. I don't even throw any other cliches out there. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And if God is for you, who can be against you? This is this God-centered optimism that we should breathe in, even as you sit here. Breathe in and know that he is for you and he will go with you and he will empower you. So don't give up. Whatever you're facing, whatever blizzard you might be walking through, keep on going because he's there. He won't leave you or forsake you. Well, General George Patton, he did what is considered by many a phenomenal feat of moving the entire Third Army in just a few days' time through the bitter, snowy cold and the treacherous terrain, marching for these days and arriving only to the huge Nazi counter-offensive in the southern flank in Belgium. For three days, the Germans, as they began on the 16th of December, they advanced under fog and rain and clouds. And there's no telling if the weather had continued how far the Germans would have advanced. But weeks before, unbeknownst to anyone on the Allied side, George Patton was sitting with his chaplain, Chaplain O'Neill, the lead chaplain of the Third Army. And Patton was who was uh, known as a man of blood and guts, and it was a, could, could curse like you wouldn't believe, was also a, a man actually of deep prayer. And he was saying to the chaplain, we are a well-prepared army, and we work really hard. The, man, the men are well-trained, but that's not enough he said. We need more prayer. Chaplain O'Neill, how are we going to get the men to pray more? Why aren't they praying more, he asked. And he and the chaplain talked about it. And O'Neill, that very day, wrote a prayer and persuaded General Patton for the prayer to be written and to be put on a Christmas card that would be distributed to all the men. 250,000 copies of the prayer were printed. And on December's 12th through 14th, they were distributed to all the men with Patton's uh, good wishes of Christmas. And on the back side, a prayer. Then, two days later, the bulge would begin. And then two days later, Patton would order his third army to begin to advance, going through the long march praying many thousands of them, perhaps hundreds of thousands of these men, taking it seriously. In fact, the, the 9,000 plus officers were all instructed in a, in a separate letter to, in, to embolden the men to pray and to pray constantly. And as the divisions arrived on the 19th and 20th of December, something amazing happened, something surprising even the weather forecasters because as the Third Army arrived, the weather broke. The weather broke into blue skies for most of a week. It was perfect flying weather. Planes came by the tens and by the hundreds and by the thousands, hammering the Nazis as they needed to be hammered because of the Allied Superior Air Force. And that weakened them enough for then for Patton's armored divisions to charge forward through the Nazi defenses, liberating the town of Baston and the 101st Airborne, freeing them. And it would only be then weeks later that the, the bulge would be destroyed, and only a few months later that the war would be over. What was in that prayer? Well, here it is. The men prayed, Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate reigns with which we have, have had to contend. Grant us fair weather for battle. Graciously hearken to us as soldiers who call thee 
that armed with thy power, we may advance from victory to victory and crush the oppression and wickedness of our enemies and establish thy justice among men and nations. Amen. Even so, what battle are you moving towards? What march are you on? Well, let us march onward, knowing that he goes with you. Let us march together. Let us march together in prayer, remembering this wonderful truth of Psalm 121, that you can keep on because he will keep watch. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would fill us with faith. Give us strength for whatever lies ahead. And may you be glorified. And we look forward to the good gifts that you have in store. In Christ's name, amen.